We acknowledge that we are on traditional territories of many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, whose footsteps have marked Alberta's lands for centuries. Welcome, Athena. Hi. Can you hear me? Hello? You bet. Yep, loud and clear. Okay, good. Well, welcome, or to wow, as we say in Cree. Um, I'm very happy to be here this evening talking about connecting with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit families. So I work, as you know, I work for Edmonton Public Schools. I am Métis, connected to the Lac Saint Anne Métis. I'm Mohawk, Cree, First um, Scottish, and French, and I have. Probably, I tell my girls, 50,000 relatives in Alberta. I'm related to Cunninghams, Belcourts, Dion's, Latans, and so I have tons of family around this area. So um, we'll go to the, the first slide, which is the treaty acknowledgement that Celeste read out at the beginning. Um, and so I'd like to start with asking the participants what what you hope to get, or if you have any questions right now, what you hope to get out of this um, webinar. I find that it will help me to, to be more interactive with you. And so maybe just a few comments on what you'd like to know is how I'd like to start tonight. They're typing down in the chat window there for you, Athena. Um, I know yeah. for myself, I can let you know, I'm, um, I believe that even as educators, uh, that um, it's part of honoring and, and learning um, about the, the different FNMI cultures um, and sharing that knowledge as well. I, I know our kids are starting to learn about it in school, um, so it's nice as parents to be able to, to know what's happening as well. Thank you. Okay, so Don, Don has said, oh, Don would like to know how to make her school, Alberta schools, more welcoming. That's great because we address some of that so that parents can be engaged. And I welcome questions, comments throughout. Um, Bev, as an EA, she'd like to know how to do better welcoming and acknowledging students students' culture. That's great. Okay, well, um, I'd like to start with talking about the treaties because that's one way to, to welcome families of First Nations and Métis culture. And so does anybody know how many treaties there are in Alberta? I'm going to talk about Alberta because that's where I'm from and that's where we are. So can anybody make a guess how many treaties are in Alberta? There, there are three treaties that are acknowledged. Um, there's two that cross over a little bit from Saskatchewan, but because there are no First Nations communities there, we recognize the three treaties, six, seven, and eight. And so treaty number eight is up north, northern Alberta, and treaty number six is more central Edmonton's in treaty six, and then treaty seven is down south where Calgary is. And so does anybody know why the treaties are numbered the way they are in Alberta. They go 8, 6, and 7. Anybody guess? I can see people are typing. Um, the three in Alberta is what I like to focus on. So they're numbered, number eight's up north, number six is in the middle, and number seven is down south.
And so the reason that the treaties are numbered the way they are is because of the date that they were signed. So the one around Edmonton was signed first in Alberta, so that was treaty number six. Um, uh, the treaties do go across the country um, up to number 11, I think. And so it, depending on the date that they were signed, that's where the, what the treaty area is numbered. And so on the PowerPoint right now, you can see that we have a poster. The artwork was done by a student from Queen Elizabeth High School here in Edmonton. And we chose her artwork last year to be on our posters. She won art contests with it, so we were pretty happy with that. And so this is an acknowledgement that we encourage our schools here in Edmonton Public to use, perhaps to use it with um, in their morning announcements or at the beginning of an assembly. Uh, we provide these posters for our schools, for one for every classroom if they want. And so we would say we acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 territory because we're in Edmonton a traditional meeting grounds, gathering place, and traveling route to the Cree, Soto, Blackfoot, Métis, Dene, and Nakota Sioux. And we acknowledge all the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. So I have found that when schools read this treaty acknowledgement, that uh, the students then start to get to know the different groups of First Nations and Métis who are in their area. So sometimes when I go into a school now and I ask them who are the First Nations, they recite from the poster, like they start saying the Cree, the Soto, the Blackfoot. And so I was thrilled the first time it happened. I was like, this is great. You know, the kids are learning the, who are the First Nations in their area from this poster. So it really works. And I would encourage you, like, if you're in a different treaty area, to make up your own poster with the groups that are in your area. If you are in, um, if you are in, in, uh, my husband's out there visiting, and so I feel like I should go tell him to be quiet. Um, so if you're in Alberta and you want to use our poster as your own to you as an acknowledgement in your schools please feel free we share everything that we have and um so i will show you on our website where everything is Can you just give me a minute i gotta go tell them to be quiet just while Athena's away, I'll let everyone know as well that these resources that she's talking about are available for everyone, not just for people in the Edmonton area. So um, those of you joining us uh, down uh, in, in Leduc, uh, in Nova Scotia, although you're in Fort Saskatchewan, um, these resources will all be available for you. I'm really sorry about that. No problem, um, Athena. Yeah, they're getting a bit excited. My brother's busy. And so, yeah, I'm going to show you on our website where you can find this poster and print it. Or, and since most of you are in Alberta and on Treaty 6 territory, um, please feel free to use this poster. Because I, when I was seeing where you guys were all from, I was thinking, oh, they're all <coughs> Treaty 6 except for Saskatchewan. So... Athena, um, another way. Posters? Oh, sorry, Athena. Go ahead. Yep. Do they have posters for the different treaty areas too, like for Treaty Seven territory or Treaty Eight? Um, well, you could contact the school districts there, like maybe Calgary Public or Grand Prairie Public. I'm not sure whether the other school districts have them, but that would be a good Perfect. place to start. Perfect. Thank you. And so another way to connect with families is through a sharing circle. And so um, if perhaps in a family meeting or at your school council meeting, you could start open with the treaty acknowledgement and use the sharing circle, the seven sacred teachings. And as was pointed out this morning, the, uh, the seventh one, which is bravery, 
probably is behind the picture, so it didn't um, come through. But they are love, courage, humility, truth, wisdom, respect, and bravery. And so we, we use these teachings in a sharing circle where we respect ourselves and others and what's said in the circle stays in the circle. I think it would be really neat to use this in a school council meeting or if you're meeting with a family or in your classroom. You can use it with your students to talk about, discuss things that maybe they're learning. You would use um, something to pass around, and so like a talking stick or a favorite stuffed animal maybe if you're working with kids, that who's ever holding the talking stick gets to speak, and what's said in the circle stays in the circle, and it is about respect. And so it is one way of incorporating some of the culture into your classroom or into your school council meetings. So does anybody have any questions or comments yet? I encourage you to ask me questions, ask me any of your wonderings. Um, that would be great. And so I would like to uh, share with you a technique or a strategy that I learned when I was working in our communities on the Michif language project, that when I meet with the families or the elders or the people, I would um, introduce myself in the way that I did at the beginning of this webinar. And so I asked around to the Cree speakers, and it's call, they call it Utsutansi. So it's who are you, who's your belly button connected to is what it means. Who are you connected to? So in our communities, one of the first things people will ask me is where I'm from. And so uh, it's just, it's a cultural thing. We're very used to it. And I find that it helps families to be more comfortable with teachers and principals and to come into a school council. So this morning, we, um, some, of, some of the people typed it in the chat and those who have audio told us. So if we could, we'll have a sharing circle now. And if somebody would like to start, and as you see on the screen, you can start with your name, where your family's from, your roots are, your culture, whatever you want to share with us would be great. So I'd like to invite the participants to do that. Whoever would like to go first, that would be great. Hi, everybody. Hi. My name is Bev Thompson. My family is from southern Ontario. My roots are Scottish and English. My parents are from Hamilton but live in Nova Scotia. And my grandparents are from Hamilton, Ontario. And my great-grandparents are all from England and Scotland. Thank you very much. And I would like to invite Brenda or Celeste as well, if you'd like to share, that would be great. Sure, I'll go next. Um, my name is Brenda. My family is from Edmonton, but my roots are from England, Scotland, and Ireland. Um, my parents are English and Scottish. And my grandparents were, hmm, I know my grandma, my grandparents were from Ireland, but I'm not sure about the other side of the family, so <laughs> that's me in a nutshell. Thank you. And I see, Dawn, that you've got your yours in chat, so thank you very much for sharing that with us. Hi, I'm Jen, and my family is from the Edmonton area, and my roots are Irish and English. And my parents are kind of a mix. <laughs> and uh, I don't know too much about my family and my grandparents, actually. So it's kind of a mystery to me. Thanks. Thank you very much. Is that every, did we get everybody? I'll throw my hat in the ring. My name is Celeste Berdinsky. And my family is from Alberta, we're kind of all over the place. <laughs> uh, my roots, though, are from England and Wales and Ireland. 
my parents are Shirley and Jack Langford, and my grandparents were Lila and John Langford, and Rita and Duncan Plain. Thank you very much. And so when I'm in a circle with uh, participants, I like to ask them how that felt for them to share that with, with us, with people you've just met, perhaps. Maybe we could have a few comments of how that felt. Okay. Um, it's exciting to hear um, everybody's roots and where everybody's from. Yeah, great. And Bev said she feels like we are more equal, and that definitely is part of the strategy is to help help parents feel more comfortable, more on a you know level. Because as we know, especially young students, they tell the teachers or whatever everything. You know, teachers know a lot about families. Yet families, all they know sometimes is that you're an EA or a grade five teacher or you're on school council. So this is just one way to help uh, connect with the families. Any other comments or any other questions? I just find it really interesting to hear where we're all from and, and uh, it, yeah, it, it puts a whole different slant on the sharing circle side of it. I think Bev's right, it puts you kind of on equal footing and, and it's just it's really interesting and exciting. Great, thank you. Um, Dawn? Is this a formal way of introducing yourself when meeting with elders or anybody else? Yeah, yeah, definitely. This is something that I would do when I meet um, a, a new el an elder who I don't know who they, you know, the first time meeting them, I guess what I'm trying to say, or when I meet with a family for the first time who are, you know, when the family is First Nations, Métis, or Inuit. This is something that we're used to in our culture, that, you know, <clears throat> we just regularly tell each other where we're from, who we're connected to, who's our family. I don't know if you've heard the saying, all my relations. And so, you know, we talk about who we're related to. And some of the time you find out that you're related, this person's probably your cousin. They're probably on your family tree. So that's even more exciting when you meet a cousin. Any anything else before we move on? So I thought I'd tell you a bit about where where I work and what we do to help our teachers, principals, school councils, everybody who's working in education at Edmonton Public Schools to connect with our culture, with our families. So our unit is made up of consultants, and um, we we work in leadership groups under four assistant superintendents. So there's two consultants per leadership group, and we work in catchments. So our school, the schools that we work in, go from kindergarten to grade 12. So we can support students in transitions and work with entire families because their students are going to the schools within our catchments. And so this is a new model that we've just started working under the last couple of years and seems to be working quite well for us. We also have a cultural consultant who is amazing with connecting arts, arts through cultural identity. She's from Saskatchewan. She is Lakota Sioux and has incredible knowledge around how to make, um, do beading and make different things with the students painting. The students really come away with a, a positive sense of their cultural identity after they've worked with uh, Holly Uzichpi is her name. We also have a mental health consultant who does a lot of work organizing things like the Jack Summit. She does mental health first aid, and she's involved in many other pro programs and projects related to mental health, physical health, spiritual health, all of the health of that our students and families um, need. 
support with. So recently, we hired a research consultant, which I'm pretty thrilled about because she can help us with our statistics and and so that we can learn from it and learn what's working and what's not and what we can do better by looking at our stats. And she's she's amazing. She knows all the programs, and so we're very lucky to have her as well. And we have. A a supervisor, wonderful supervisor, Melissa Purcell, who supports us in our work and moves the work forward with the leadership teams that we work with. We also have liaisons mostly in our high schools. We are working to get more in our junior highs. And so all to get all of us together, we plan and host an annual grad, which we call an honoring celebration which is a barrier-free grad for First Nations, Métis, and Inuit students and their families to come to the dinner and the students walk across the stage. The superintendent comes. We invite chiefs. We invite the mayor. All kinds of people come and, and give, bring greetings to the students and congratulate, congratulate them on graduating. And um, we also organize and support summer school courses such as CALM and with a First Nations, Métis, and Inuit cultural theme. And so students can get three credits or five credits through summer courses uh, as well as spring courses that we're doing now. So that was a lot of information. So I would like to open the floor if you have any comments or questions about what I've just discussed about what our unit does. And we are always available to support through email in particular. If you have questions or you want to know who to talk to about different things, we will always try to help. Um, I know, so there's a question from Bev, do all school divisions have a similar support? Um, I know Calgary Public does because we've been down there and, and visited with their unit. Here in Edmonton, Edmonton Catholic, they have a unit that we work closely with. They're called Aboriginal Learning Services, and so we partner with them and the city. So we all work together to provide experiences for our students. Um, uh, I'm not sure about smaller s school jurisdictions. I used to work up in Grand Prairie, and I know that Grand Prairie Public has has a small unit, mostly made up of liaisons in their schools, but they do have a, a supervisor who works out of head office in Grand Prairie. And so we have many consultants that, so, you know, if you have questions, you want to know who to reach in your area, we can definitely help you figure out who that would be or where it would be. So um, we can go to our website now. Brenda has over in the chat area. So if you click on that link, I will show you a few things on our website. You can um, go through it at your leisure, but I'll just point out some things that, that might pique your interest. So over on the left-hand side, we have our First Nations Métis in Inuit Family Guide. This is a really good resource when you're meeting with families or at your inviting families into your school council or into your school. In it, we have teased out different cultural programs that we have at Edmonton Public, like Cree Language, our Aboriginal Head Start, and the schools that offer Cree like and offer cultural teachings, like our Amiskwichi one of our high school, junior high, high schools. And so it's just information like that, that we felt that families of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit students would be interested in. And while we were making the guide, we also took it out to family nights and to our partners in the community to ask if they, you know, to get their feedback. So all the documents that we create are made with our community. and feedback from them, as well as our Career Pathways Guide. And so that's aimed more for the high, junior high, high school, but it, ha it, it does have information in there for as young as kindergarten. 
And I'd really like to draw your attention to our guiding document, First Nations Métis Inuit guiding document. What I use this document for now is the wording. So if anybody is applying for funding uh, on behalf of First Nations Métis Inuit students and their families or to introduce the culture into your school or school council, we encourage you to that um, please feel free to use the wording out of this document. Um, cut and paste if you want. Everything on our website is is for you to use and we encourage um, all pe other people to use it. Um, there, we, there is no plagiarism. We don't look for anything like that. We really want to share everything that we have. We also have a newsletter called Honoring Our Voices. So if something's going on in our schools, we encourage teachers, principals to take pictures, to write a paragraph, and we put it in our newsletter and we send it out to our schools quarterly, usually. And so that's something maybe that school councils even could look at putting together newsletters such as that. And the self-identification information, so if people have questions about why self-identify or who self-identifies, this information comes directly from Alberta Education because they are the ones who set the standard for the self-identification. And so this is where our poster is. And so you could um, print it from here or take the words from here and make it your own for your own area. And if you need help doing that, I could definitely help you find the right people to find out who are the First Nations, Métis, Inuit in your area. So that's the left side of our website. I would just like to show you a couple things up at the top. The ribbon at the top where it says Educates. If you click on that, this is something that we we have made up educates in our unit and we lend them out to our schools uh, for a two week period and then the school truck mails it to the next school who's going to use it. And so under the paragraph that describes the educates in the box where it says First Nations, if you go down to the third sentence, it says click here for a description of the contents. So if you click that and you go in and you take a look, and it's got all the educates that we have. And when you click on the folder, it opens up and it, um, or on the arrow, it has everything in there that you would need to make your own kit except for the artifacts. So you could view them or download them, print them, put them in a binder, and then buy the, it, it also talks about the artifacts that you would need to go into your educate. If you have trouble finding them, just um, send me an email and I can talk to our admin assistant who buys all our stuff and find out where she buys them. Up at the top of that page, there are there is a list of places where we buy some things and so you could try those places first if you're interested in making these kits. Um, any questions? Hi, Dawn. Hello. You actually had to go on to the, um, click on the link there. Uh, Brenda posted a few screen down, uh, roll up in the chat room. It's the uh, HTTPS sites.google.com. Uh, if you, the FNMI education, if you click on that, it would actually take you to this uh, First Nations Métis and Inuit education website from the Edmonton Public School site. Uh, and she was, uh, Athena has been talking about some of the features that are on the website. Yeah, and if you have any further questions or you think of something later on, please feel free to send me an email. And so everything on our website, like I said, we share everything. You can look at it at your leisure, go through. Um, we also have in on um, the resources, the liter our literacy resources. 
there is the Literacy C Kit, which is something that schools can start with. It's, it's got 76 books in it from K to 12 with uh, First Nations, Métis, Inuit theme. To buy all the books costs about $1,000, so that's something that maybe school councils might be interested in supporting, or you could talk to your principal or to find out. And if you go to our website and go under our literacy resources, under reviews, you can, you can scroll down and you'll see the literacy seat kit, and you can click on it and go through and look at all the books that are in there, and there's a bit of a, a review about the books. As well, if you have questions about books, you can also send me an email and I can try to help you um, find out whether they're, they're approved or reviewed. We, that's another thing that our unit does is review, review books for our schools and for publishers. And so any questions about our website? Um, there's also EduCites in there. There's one that is on the history of Edmonton. It's called a Miskwichiwa Sky Gun. And one of my coworkers, oh, thank you, Jen. Jen. One of my coworkers did that EduCite. It has six lessons in it of the, the history from an indigenous perspective of Edmonton. And they're great. Like, and anybody can just go in and print them off and alter them to fit your area if you want. or or just use them the way they are. And after, they're, they're really aimed at the grade four curriculum, but you could, you know, teachers, of course, know how to make them fit for the class that they're teaching. As well, after schools do the lesson plans, teachers' classrooms do the lesson plans, they can take their students on a river walk, which my colleague does, and we're all, all of us in our unit are learning how to do the river walk from the lesson plan, and, and so it's very interactive, very hands-on. It's, um, it's really a great way to teach kids as well and to teach them about the culture. So I'm going to move on to the next slide and talk a bit about protocol. So the picture that we see here are some of the medicines that we use in our protocols, smudging, sweats, um, powwows. Does, do you recognize any of the medicines that are in the pictures? Is it big enough for you to see? If anybody wants to take a guess at what they are. I think sweet grass is the long braid. That's right, it is. Sage, yeah, definitely. This right here is sage. And this is fungus. And this is a root. That's fungus and a root. Yeah, rat root, I think, is, is the medicine. And so we, we use the sweet grass in a braid because it makes it strong. And the elders say it's for spiritual, emotional, and physical. And so we, when braided all together, it makes it a very strong, you, you know, when, when I'm doing a presentation, I have the sweet grass, and you can see that you can't pull it apart because of the braid, which makes it stronger. So sweet grass is a male medicine, they call it, which can be used by by both male and females, unless a female is in her moon time, then she can't, we can't smudge with sweet grass. Sage is the female medicine, and so women can smudge with sage any time that they want. And as well, men can smudge with sweet grass as well. Um, the fungus, the elders say, helps calm it's very calming when you smudge with it. And so I encourage, like if schools uh, have smudge in their schools and kids sometimes, you know, are upset or whatever's going on, that if they have some fungus, that they can, the child can smudge with it and help them calm down, like a type of med meditation. 
And so, Celeste, do you have, have a question? I do, Athena. This might be a silly question. Uh, does the braid of the sweet grass have anything, any kind of correlation or relation to the, the braids that the young men wear and the, the women wear in their hair? Yeah, the braid is quite prominent in our cultures. You see a lot of people wear braids um, for strength because there is a belief, you know, that our hair gives us strength. And so, yeah, I would say definitely that the braid is significant for strength. Thank you. Gotcha. Um, and so I have listed on here the teachings. We, I was gifted from my friend with a smudge bag and the smudge teachings, which she received from her elder. And so I feel that I can go into schools, go into classrooms, and do a smudge teaching with because I was gifted the smudge bag. I wouldn't, you know, if if other people want to do the smudge or to teach about smudge, then you can ask maybe First Nations or Métis people in your area or ask me to help you find someone to teach you about smudging and help you get your own smudge bag. So that because it is a beautiful thing. I mean, people smudge at home in the privacy of their own home as well. It helps calm and, you know, just think positive thoughts. Jen, do you have a question? Hi, yeah, I do. I, I just wanted to know about that. Um, so is someone who is not a First Nations able to be taught how to properly smudge and then be able to pass that on or share that with our class? Oh, for sure, yeah. Definitely. Um, you, you, like everyone, anyone else, can receive the teachings, can receive a smudge bag, and then you, once you receive the teachings, then you have them. To, you can pass them on. You can show them in your classroom. Definitely, yes. Brenda? I was wondering with regards to that, is this something that you do more than once? Um, it, I know a friend of mine had mentioned that she had done something like that when she had moved into a new home. Um, is it something that needs to be done more than once? Or? Um, I would say it's a personal thing that people, when they move into a new home, will smudge the home, definitely. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, if you know if something happened that brought negative vibes into your house or into your classroom, or mm -hmm. and you just it's like a cleansing, definitely. And you do it as often whenever you feel the need. You know, okay. it's a personal thing, mm -hmm. definitely. Um, sometimes we smudge before a conference or or I encourage schools to use it for students if they need just a quiet place to calm down and center themselves or and you know there are definitely First Nations Métis students who know how to smudge who smudge at home with their families and so are used to it and they could even if they felt comfortable, that could be, you know, like, almost like a presentation to their class to teach their class about smudging. That would be, be a, a, a really good way to connect. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I used to work with an Inuit woman, and she said they don't smudge. The Inuit don't smudge. So, just for your information. So. Um, when elders, I'd like to talk to a little bit about elders. Uh, we help our schools connect to elders, so we are we would be the first contact because we have the relationships with certain elders. Like my colleagues have different relationships with different elders. So depending on what the school asks for, that we would um, perhaps ask each other, ask around which elder would um, be a be the, the best fit for maybe something like that. And even if we do find an elder and we we would do the tobacco offering with the teacher if or the person who is requesting an elder to come into the classroom or to a school council meeting. And the first medicine is tobacco. 
so we would do the tobacco offering and our unit supplies our schools with Mother Earth tobacco. Um, we don't use cigarettes because, you know, we work with an impressionable population and so we use natural tobacco. We talk about how, you know, the elder would give it back to Mother Earth as a tobacco offering. And so some, when you go to ask an elder, request them to come into your classroom. I'll answer your question in a second, okay, Beth? Um, so when you're asking an elder, requesting them maybe to come into your classroom to do storytelling or something, you would take tobacco with you, make the offering. If the elder accepts the tobacco, then they have made an agreement that they will come into your school. If they feel they are not the right person for what you're asking, they will not accept the tobacco. They might um, point you in a different direction, give you somebody else's name, or just say, you know, I don't feel like I'm the right person for that. And so that's one way of connecting to the elders to in the Edmonton area. So we have a list, we know the elders, and once once the relationship is built between the school and the elder, our school council and the elder, then, you know, that's our cue to back away. And so we are just there as a go-between until the relationship get, is strong enough to um, hold. So um, I'll answer Bev's question. Is there something similar to smudging for the Inuit culture? I don't think so. Um, Eileen never told us that there was anything similar. So um, I, I'm not Inuit, but I know from working with her she just said they don't smudge. That's not part of their culture. So I'm not sure if there's something else they do. And there are, so Jen has asked what about elders in the outlying areas. Definitely um, the elders do live in outlying areas, like out at Alexis or at Paul Band, which is out by Wadman or, you know, Enox just outside of Edmonton, or Alexander, which is um, just outside of Edmonton as well. So there are many reserves across Alberta where usually that's where our elders come from. And so usually that's where our elders come from. And so wherever you're living, the area that you're in, if you're wondering if there's elders in your area, you could send me an email, I could ask around, I could find out. So connecting with them, connecting with elders, is that what you're asking, Jen? Yeah, so we can, we can help our, um, another way to connect with, um, families and elders of First Nations Métis Inuit students is to phone the education director at the band office at a reserve that's close to you would probably be the best because then you can start building relationships with the people on the reserves that it may be like somebody is from Leduc, I think it said. Um, so may a reserve maybe down south. Uh, down towards, well, the Duke's not far from Edmonton, so maybe Muscochise is out there. There's like the four bands out there, or you know, Enoch is in Edmonton, or and usually they most bands have an education director that you could contact, and they're used to talking to other school districts and working together, so that would be a really good way. If you needed help in getting that started, I would always be happy to help support you to get in contact with people. Celeste? Hi, Athena. I was just wondering about um, elders. Are they, I, I think myself, I've always had it envisioned in my head that they're elderly people. Is that always the way or can they be younger elders or, or what makes someone an elder? Well, that's a very good question. Um, they, a lot of, most of the time they are elder, elderly, but not always, you're right. Um, what makes 
an elder, an elder is their community. Is if they are if their community says they're an elder, then we accept that they're an elder. Um, we in our community we talk about we get suspicious when people are out self proclaiming that they're an elder. Um, uh-huh. We don't we don't like to encourage our schools to work with people who don't have their community behind them. And so we work directly with the reserves and in in who they like we ask them who their elders are and they usually will t- will put us in contact with them is how we have been finding our elders. And I work with incredible people who um, one of my colleagues used to work for the Alberta government, and so she has a great connection to lots of elders across Alberta. And so, you know, in this, uh, she knows a lot of them in the south. She did a lot of work down there. And so we have a list of elders, but we don't make that open to the public because we like to make sure that the, the elders not you know, too busy, too overworked as well. It's about the relationship, and so we like to help support the relationship between the new person and the elder. Right. Excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. So uh, we also have a document coming out, a protocol document. Hopefully it will be out before the end of this year. And so it talks a lot about engaging with an elder and the medicines and the protocols and um, different information. And so I told the group this morning that when that document is ready, I will send it to Wendy Kiever and she could send it out, the link out to whoever attended the webinar so that as soon as we, as soon as we get it, I'll send it out to you. It's going to, it's a really good document, you know, it's a draft and right now and so we've all seen it and we're really just waiting for it to come out and it it has a lot of tried to explain a lot about what I'm telling you on this one slide so any more questions comments or anything before I go to the next one okay so did everyone get a chance to watch the family night video oh good 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 so we were um, we were asked to partner with Edmonton Regional Learning Consortium to make that family night video uh, I'm a social worker, so that's one of the my specialties, I guess, is uh, help supporting schools to host a family night. And as you saw, the family night just has a theme of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. Everyone is welcome to come and learn about our culture. And so when in a group I would ask um, how schools or school councils how how would you how do you think that you could reach into the circle of First Nations Métis Inuit school community to make it more welcoming? Um, do you have ideas that you might want to try or might want to discuss right now? That you might you know need a little bit of support with perhaps. Hi, Beth here. Hi. Hi. Um, I think one of the things that um, I'm struggling with in our school is that I see a need because the kids that I end up working with as an EA are the ones who are struggling um, and often are the ones who are First Nations. Um, and it's getting everybody at the school to see that we need to we need to be aware of their cultural needs and be welcoming of that. So how do you how do you convince or show others the importance of this work? 
Does that make sense? Um, yeah, for yeah, sure. For sure. So staff is what you're talking about. Um, yeah. Have you have you heard of the blanket exercise, the Kairos blanket exercise? Yeah, actually, we did it with our grade nines at our school, and it was great. And the teachers who did it loved it. But as a staff, a lot we had a number of them say, "Oh, that was such a waste of time. It took too much resources. It took away from their class time." which I thought was really unfortunate because the students afterwards were so excited about it. So did they, were they, did these teachers who said that, did they go through the blanket exercise as well? No, they didn't. No, because it's, it's quite powerful, as you know, to go through it with your staff. Um, we do that. That's one of our roles. We do a lot of blanket exercise, actually, and and we build student leaders. So one thing you might consider doing is the grade nines who've been through it, that they become the facilitators of the blanket exercise and maybe do it for the staff of the school. Like invite all the staff to come to the blanket exercise. That we, are, we have the scripts on our, our website as well if you wanted to take a yeah. look at them from there. Um, yeah. It's it's hard work. This like because of our where our past has not been that great. But, no. You know, we have to persevere with this information now and just try to try to build understanding of why it's important. Okay. Yes, I, really, I like that idea. Thank you. Um, I work with leadership students to to help them facilitate the blanket exercise, and we just did it. On Monday, they, the, these students did it for the school staff, and it was amazing. The staff really appreciated the students doing it and, you know, the leadership that, that it builds. Well, and I think if it came from the students, it would be received better than if it came from another staff member. Yeah. Or yeah. from admin, right? Like from the principals. Yeah, yeah that's right. Huh. Neat. Thanks. No problem. Um, and yes, Jen, the blanket exercise is on our website. Um, I think it's in under educates that if you go in there and scroll down, you'll see it'll say click here and then the script will come up. And if you and can't find it, note. please um, go ahead. Uh huh. You can always Sorry, email I me and I'll help you find. Um, Millwood United Church in South Edmonton is actually doing a blanket exercise this Sunday at church. Oh, That's good. That's service on Sunday morning, so at 10.30. Oh, wow. <laughs> if anybody wants to go and participate in one, it's welcome. Everybody is welcome. Um, but um, the church is doing one um, as a service. The minister is away this week, so uh, we decided that that was a good way to to do a service. So if anybody is interested, you can certainly go to Millwoods United on Sunday at church for 1030. Wow, that's great to hear. That's cool. Um, and so I just had a couple of questions there about reconciliation because this, you know, Bev, what you're talking about is about reconciliation. And, and so how do we just share our information and respect each other? as part of reconciliation. And so, you know, to talk about the welcoming environment, um, to expand the definition of parent to include the family, the elders, in our communities, we all, we take an active role in raising the children, aunties, uncles, grandparents, and so um, for parent councils, which is what a lot of them are called here in Edmonton, I encourage them to call them school councils because, you know, when you say parent council, maybe grandparents or aunts and uncles just think it's only for parents when it's actually for a school community. So families are welcome. So uh, I know the Alberta School Council Association likes to call them school councils and I agree that that's, that is more inclusive, I guess, more welcoming. And 
so as I talked about before, in your meetings, in your classrooms, um, you can use the seven teachings, you can use the sharing circle. When I walk into a school, I look at the halls and the walls in particular to see if I can see myself as a Métis person in the schools, the resources, the literacy seat kit, the books. Um, our protocol document, as soon as it's ready, I'll send it to you. <coughs> and the blanket exercise, which is on the Kairos website. So if you just Google Kairos, it'll come up. And there's other things you can do, the Project of Heart, after you do the blanket exercise, they have different ideas. So looks like we have two minutes left. So I'd like to leave a few minutes for any comments or further ending questions. Thank you, Jim. It's very nice of you. And please feel free to contact me. Oh, that's great, Bev. I'm glad. Hi, I just wanted to mention that I was coming from a bit of a different angle. Um, I was a teacher many years ago, and uh, then I stayed home to raise my children. And I'm heading back to school to upgrade, going back to the U of A. And one of the courses that we need to take is, is EDPS 474, and it's learning all about um, culture and how to implement uh, FNMI into our classrooms. And I think it's just a fascinating thing, so this really was my introduction to it. And I think as a student teacher, I think it's just fantastic that you're pointing us in the right direction and giving us some resources to work with. So thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate that. This has been fantastic, Athena. The, the short time we've had, we've sure got a lot of resources here to, to uh, you know, take the opportunity to explore. Thank you so much for sharing everything. Uh, and for joining us this evening. And thank you to everyone for uh, participating tonight. Um, I will turn the recording off, but if you still have some questions for Athena, um, we can wait here for another minute or two, or feel free to uh, email her as well. We've posted her email address there with Edmonton Public uh, in the chat window. Uh, so that you can keep in touch with Athena as well. Uh, and if you do go to exit the um, webinar, you just click on the X in the top right hand corner of your screen and you'll get a pop-up uh, pop -up window that's just going to ask you if you're sure you want to exit uh, and just click on yes and you'll be um, out of the room. So thank you again everyone for joining us and thank you so much Athena for sharing all of this information. Greatly appreciated. Thank you, thank you for having me. <laughs>